Okay, this is a video that's a preview of coming distractions. This is Anoni Nomino's Revelation 17 meter. In the video description, you'll find a link to the Frank Forum thread where you can download it and play with it yourself. Um, before I introduce Matthew uh, Mark 13, which is just stunning, I wanted you to see what Revelation 17 is playing on. Revelation 17 is playing back to and playing on Matthew 24, which is first, Ephesians 1 and Luke 21, which are second, because they were both uh, published the same year. We can tell that from their dateline meters, which I'm going to go through on this one here so you know. And Mark 13, which was issued on Passover exactly one year before the temple would be taken down. Now, how do I know all that? Well, part of the reason I know all that is right here in Matthew, in Revelation 17. So, we're going to go through it. My, um, John and other writers did it. They actually, the pattern actually started with Moses in Genesis 1. John doesn't necessarily wait until the text sevens to give you his dateline. The, the typical uh, tradition that's in the scripture about how this meter works is that the very first paragraph that sevens is the writer telling you when he writes but like any other kind of tradition or style there are a lot of as it were variations from it okay because you know you have a, a common thing like you have you red but there's scarlet versus faded red versus purplish red and they all have special names so you have a base a base color or a base meter pattern and then the writers play with it to make variations on it that's how music works too that's how speech works okay so when John does his meters like Moses he takes every single clause now this first one it, you can't break it except this anoni nominum broke it because the words are too integral to what follows okay so he just made the first, It's you know, it seems like it's more than one clause. See, because you got ek here. Alright. So you can maybe say, Kai elten eis ek ton heptangelon, heptangelon, ton echonton das hepta fialas, fialas. Okay. But it really doesn't work to break the clause here because then came one from among the tone is being used as a preposition that's classical greek the seven messengers angels in this case those having the seven vials v-i-a-l in english this is where we get the word vial from so you can't really separate the act into a new clause all right, so he's got 19. And of course, if you're familiar with Sothic cycles, this is kind of a joke on those people who use the sun, the moon, and the stars to tell the future. Okay, which is a joke on Rome because that's what Rome did. But the 19 has a very specific meaning in John that he uses in all of his letters. I don't mean 19 itself, but I mean the first clause. He always uses the first clause to date back to something he wrote whether it's sevens or not but here it's got triple value it's not just 19 hi I wrote you 19 years I wrote the gospel 19 years ago okay actually it's not even saying that um, all of his dates when he writes what he writes is dated from temple down He's following the, the convention that Daniel used when Daniel said his prayer in Daniel 9. And maybe in the other books of Daniel, but I haven't parsed those to know Daniel's all, all of Daniel's datelines. So he's saying, hi, I'm writing you the 19th year. It's real important to say that. In the 19th year after Temple Down. Now, when he writes, and I've already done the meters on this, when he writes the Gospel of John, first John he was always dating in terms of years he's writing from when the temple went down 
So now he's writing in the 19th year from when the temple went down. But get this. Here's the triple play. He's also writing 19 years after Mark's gospel. See, because when you go through John's gospel, he doesn't talk about any of that stuff in Mark 13. He didn't talk about it at all. Why? Because God was reserving the time when he would be on Patmos to cover it. And so he's covering it now. This is the alert. See, because in the day that when, when John was writing, everybody memorized scripture orally by syllable counts. And they would have gotten used to his style of first clause that he writes. By the time you can actually break it, he's giving you a dateline, even if it's not seventh, from Temple Fall. But they would have gotten Mark 19 years prior. He's writing 19th year after Temple Fall and 19 years, plural, after Mark wrote his gospel. So this is yet another proof that Mark wrote his gospel in 69 AD, exactly one year before the Temple fell. Now, John is writing Revelation he, he gives his dateline so precisely in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, I can say with reasonable accuracy that he's writing on the 4th of Kislev in 88 AD because of the way he splits, the, he splits his, his meters. He has a very distinct way of writing. He's not the only one in the Bible who did it that way, but he specializes in it. The 4th of Kislev is 21 days before the 25th of Kislev. The 25th of Kislev is what we call Christmas. So he's writing just before the Lord turns age 92. Just before it. So now the temple had fallen in August of 70 AD and you don't have such a thing as a half a syllable. So it's really apt that he writes 19 years after Mark wrote who also gave us a precise date of Pesach, Passover, 69 AD is when he wrote Mark's Gospel. So that's 19 years later, but, you know, Pesach was at the beginning of the, of the whatchamacallit, um, a sacred year, all right? Pesach is the beginning of the sacred year, and, and uh, John is using uh, Rosh Hashanah as his fiscal year. Okay, so it really is 19th year, but not 19 years after the temple fell, because it's 88 AD at the end of the year in a Roman calendar. But it's 19 years after Mark wrote, because Mark is writing based on the vernal equinox. Okay, so that's why this is so clever to use the 19th. Plus, it's playing on the whole sun, moon, and stars thing, which is, you know, a main, you know, catchphrase in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark. So, it's cute. 19 years is a lunar cycle. They call it Sothic. That's what the Egyptians used to use. Okay, now watch. 19 years. we got to get a calculator here. I'm obviously using the 32-bit version of Windows while making this because in the 64-bit you can't do what I'm doing now. Okay, <clears throat> he's writing in 88 AD. So now you add 19. So the seventh, the 19-year period prophetically is going from Chi to Fialas and ends at 107 AD. Now that's important because the vile judgments even though it's depicting literal tribulation, all prophecy is dual entendre, or sometimes multiple entendre. And the whole pro point of having a timeline that applies to history before the tribulation is so that you can be better informed about the character of the tribulation before it happens, so you won't be deceived. Okay? This is providing you a, a history of the attempts by Satan to get the rapture to occur to get it to occur when he thinks he's got favorable conditions for his own arguments. He's trying to make it occur and at the same time he's trying to delay it. 
which sounds kind of contradictory, but it is contradictory. He's trying both. At one moment, it seems like, oh, I need the rapture now. And at another moment, it's like, oh, I need to delay it. It's kind of like the Republicans trying to revise Obamacare. Okay. So we're at 107 A.D., because he's writing in 88 A.D., by the time you get to the end of the 19th. What was so important about that? Especially when you're saying, Hi, one of the, one of the angels came up to me who, who had one of the, the seven vials. The vials are the judgments for the last half of the tribulation. So he's connecting a year in the present, soon present, 19 years from when John writes, to that future. He's drawing a parallelism so you understand better why there were going to be vile judgments. This is really scary when you, when you connect it. In 107 AD, one of the primary things that was happening is that everybody was rejecting the Bible amongst Christians. One of them in particular, actually there were two of them, but one in particular, a guy named Justin Martyr. They were rejecting, when you reject the Bible, you start to reject the Jews. And there was a brewing anti-Semitism along with a brewing, um, what do you want to call it, rejection of Scripture, which is why Revelation 1 through 3 read as they do. It's addressing the apostasies that were occurring at, d during the very same time that um, John was on Patmos in 88 AD. So he's like, if we su subtract that, well, it's 19 years, from 88 AD, he's saying that, hi, the apostasy that you saw covered in Revelation 1 is going to go on and keep going on. And, you know, it gets really bad starting at 107. Even though Revelation had come out in 88 AD. In other words, in the 19 years after Revelation comes out, the Christians are still not going to listen. So vile judgments have to be put on them. But it's not the official tribulation, but it will be tribulation-like. And that's exactly what starts happening in 107. The Christians are so obnoxious that there start to be mob riots against them. Starting here. And that's where all of our so-called church father writings start up. One of whom, and you can see just how bad it is, is Justin Martyr. Really vile guy. They're horrible. Really horrible. His whole thing is to be against the, the Jews. Trifo is the one of the books that he wrote. And you can read it at ccel.org or any place else that houses the Church Father writings like earlychristianwritings.com. And just read how horrible he is. That's, he's indicative because they preserved his writings. See, when you have the writings preserved by somebody, of somebody, supposedly, whether it's really him or some other name, then that's telling you that a whole bunch of people favorably regarded those writings enough to preserve them. Because it wasn't easy to preserve writings in the ancient world. So somebody spent all that time and trouble to keep copying down what Justin Martyr wrote which meant they agreed with it. Okay, and to this day, the Catholic Church praises Justin Martyr. I mean, Martyr isn't really his last name. Okay, it's a nickname. But that's when Christianity goes so bad that the vile judgments technically will become due against Christians. Alright, but that's not where he's actually stopping with it. But he he's benchmarking it because that's when you know, it became necessary for Rome to pay attention to the Christians and start instituting uh, various forms of judgment against them because they were so obnoxious. And the guy who was in charge at this time in 107 AD was a guy named Trajan. Okay? Now that's really important because Trajan, who's in the middle of his rule at this point, will end up dying ten syllables later. So now we go, Kai... And, well, I actually have to do it. Kai, e, la, le, sen, met, emu. Kai, le, kai, and you don't elide it here. Okay. Kai, e, la, le, sen. Kai, e, la, le, sen. Five syllables. Met, with, and notice how he's got the, the apostrophe there. 
So he's definitely counting syllables. He doesn't want you to pronounce the A that's normally at the end. Okay? Ka ela le sen met emu. Ka ela le sen met emu. Legon. By the time you get to legon, that's 10 syllables. That's 117 AD. And here's how you prove it. Okay, it's the 29th syllable. So you take 29 plus John's writing date in Revelation 1 1, 8 8, and you get 117. Now that's when Trajan dies. And the interesting thing about Trajan's death is he dies in the same month that the temple went down. So he's counting his years from when the temple went down, which was at the end of August in 70 AD. You should be able to confirm that anywhere you want on the internet. My favorite source for that story and the timeline is Military History Magazine from uh, December of 1995. Because it has a long article on the takedown of the temple there. Okay, but Trajan dies in August. Actually, he dies on my mother's birthday. Um, in 117 AD. Now the big story behind that, see you'd have to know your history but to see how, how witty this is. And remember it's prophecy and God knows everything so he knows how to be witty too. Is that of course when you're dying, you're saying something, your last words. I don't know what Trajan's last words were, but supposedly, and this is where it gets to be so, so witty about using Legon to indicate his death. The thing that's so remarkable about the story of Trajan's death is that his wife, I want to say her name was Faustina, his wife wanted Trajan to be succeeded by Hadrian. Okay, Hadrian at the time of Trajan's death was in Syria. That's why this word is going to be so funny when we get there. Hadrian um, was in Syria at the time that Trajan dies. There was this big question about who would succeed Trajan because he didn't have any kids. And his wife told the Senate that Trajan said, see, legon means saying. His wife told the Senate that Trajan said Hadrian should be his heir. It wasn't in writing. Okay? His wife said that's what Trajan was saying, Legon, at his death. This is the kind of wit the Greek drama is famous for. And obviously, as you can see, you know, and if you know the history, you're going to get a lot out of this. And the idea was that we would know how to count syllables from mother, mother's knee. And we would know the history from mother's knee. But of course, people didn't care enough about Bible to pass this wit on. Legon. What was Trajan saying about his successor as he was dying? Well, his wife's supposed to know. She's there. And she goes to the Senate. This is historical fact you can verify like anywhere you want about the story of Trajan, Suetonius, for example. Dio Cassius or anybody who's writing about it at that time. Okay, Legon. Trajan supposedly said, and it was a debated thing afterwards, that he wanted Hadrian to be his successor, that he adopted Hadrian as his son. Now, people were disputing that because they felt, they gossiped, that Trajan's wife was having an affair with Hadrian. But in any event, Hadrian was not there when Trajan died. Hadrian was in Syria. So now the second word, in case you were wondering, well, well, how do you know that that interpretation is really what Lego means? Okay, let's go look at the next word. Come here. Duro. That's what Christ said to Lazarus. Duro, exo, come here, outside. The angel is saying that to John, okay, but just like in the Tertullian play, Ter Tertullus, okay, that I talked to you about earlier, about the wit of Greek drama and Roman drama in that case. Come here. That's exactly what was written to Hadrian in Syria. Come here. You're the new heir. Come here. I will show you. Okay? Come here. 
That's exactly what Hadrian got. You know, it took like mm, two weeks. If you used Imperial Post, it might take ten days. Ten days to two weeks by horse or by, by boat to get to from Rome to Syria. Okay, because they had military posts and they had the Imperial Post, and they were both very fast. Okay, you'd ride a horse for a mile, and then you'd get off the horse and you'd take a rest. Or you'd get back on a new horse and you'd ride for another mile, another mile, another mile until you were tired out. And then some other rider would replace you all carrying the diplomatic dispatches or the military dispatches. Very fast. Okay. They also used carrier pigeons, but I don't know enough about how that worked in those days. But the point was it was fast. So, within days of Trajan's death, Hadrian was getting notice of it. Duro, come here, you're the new emperor. Now, I don't know if it gets cleverer, cleverer than this. And you say, well, how do you know that it's Trajan, and how do you know that it's Hadrian? Because that's what Matthew 24 focused on, that's especially what Ephesians 1 focused on. Okay? That's especially what Luke 21 focuses on. That's what Mark 13 focuses on. Focuses on. They're doing their timelines by kings. That's not all that their timelines cover. But they're measuring the time by kings. Which is an ancient, very traditional in all cultures method of measuring time. Daniel did it for Israel's kings. His whole Daniel 9 is metered to the kings the history of the kings in Israel and he's getting that from Isaiah 53 which did the same thing future starting with David going to the last David so accounting for time by kings so-and-so was king you know and so-and-so was king for 10 years you can even read this in the book of Kings and so-and-so became king and he was king for 10 years and then he slept with his fathers and then so-and-so became king all right but it has a special application here in Revelation 17 since it's about the kings of the earth, the kingdoms of the earth. How many kings there are going to be? Five fallen, one is by the time we get down here. Okay? See, five fallen. And this is going to, the identity of the five fallen is actually given here, I, I contend. One is, of course, that's still going to be some version of Rome. And the other one is yet to come. So there, it's all about kings, explicitly in the text. All right. So it makes sense that the accounting years are accounting by kings. All right. And so it's very witty. Oh, okay, Trajan, who's, who wrote to Pliny saying, well, if they really insist that they're Christians, I suppose you have to kill them. But he really didn't want it. It was more like, don't ask, don't tell. And then Ignatius, uh, right around here, somewhere in here, comes to Trajan where he is when he's in the East and says, Okay, I'm a Christian, you have to kill me. I covered that in my earlier videos probably too much. And Ignatius then spends, you know, six months instead of like 20 days going from where he met Hadrian somewhere in Anatolia to, to Rome saying, oh, I'm going to die for Christ, I'm going to die for Christ, oh, how holy I am, I'm going to die for Christ. Okay, that, he's the prototypical Christian of that day. You can see why there were rules against Christians. And that's what was being said to Trajan. So now Trajan was supposedly saying, and everybody disputes whether it's true, that he wanted Hadrian to take his place. So in the very, you know, it was like August 7th, 8th, something like that. Our boy Trajan... Is this, there's a letter dispatched to Trajan, which he gets about 10 days later, maybe 15 days later, saying, Come here to Rome. Okay, so now the rest of this text is really very biting. I will show you the judgment of the, you know, the Poneras. Um, you want to call it evil. We get our word for pornography from it. Uh, the really bad gross things it's really poneros is a generic term great on the one who's sitting on the waters okay when you get to the end here the judgment the great judgment that's 44 syllables that's playing back to 
Matthew 24 when it uses 44 syllables because that's when you know because of the temple being taken down alright but at the same time John is using his 44 for something else you add 44 okay to the 88 when he's writing and that's 132 AD and therefore all this text now and that was especially true after Hadrian came to power when he came to Rome it's as if God was showing that it, he, how do I want to put this no sooner does Hadrian come to Rome then it gets shown to him the judgment that's due on the evil of the Jews who are going through what's called the Bar Kokhba rebellion which they had started their sedition early because they were already busy doing it. It's why he was in Syria. It was called the Kitos rebellion then. There was a sort of breather space and then they started up again and by 132 AD where this 44 is was the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Now get this, the Bar Kokhba rebellion is put down pretty quickly. All right, it takes about three years to fully put it down. So now we got tes ka de me nes. So that's thirty-two. Okay, depending on the accounts that you look at of the contemporary Roman historians, some say it took one year, some say it took three years to put down. Okay, so we got one syllable if it's one year. Okay. If it's three years, we got two more. Ka te. Now, katemines means sitting. Sitting. Now, get this. This is so much a killer. Who, because he's using classical Greek de definite article as a pronoun. Who is sitting? Okay. Tes ka te me nes. Tes ka de menes five syllables so if this is 132 then this is 133 34 35 36 37 you know it was sitting on the holy of holies by the time this word ends a pig temple a pig temple if that's not the definition of a whore a harlot then what else is? A pig temple is sitting on the Holy of Holies by the time this word ends. So you get a real clear idea of history. And of course, there is still a harlot sitting on the Holy of Holies. Only today we call it the Dome of the Rock. It's an Arab thing. See? So you're getting a real vivid sense of what it means to say the harlot is sitting on the many waters see that's a word for many that's a word for waters okay but I told as I explained before in earlier videos the water is what you think water could be doctrine Bible doctrine it could be false doctrine like you know Islam or false interpretation of Bible or Judaism I mean not all Judaism is false but like Christianity most of it's false okay politics the waters of politics is a primary meaning here and it's very political the dome of the rock is sitting there it was very political that Hadrian put Aeolia Capitolina a temple to Jupiter a pig temple because they used pigs for their sacrifices on top of the holy of holies right here at the end of the word so John is very much tying back to and actually elaborating on Matthew 24 Ephesians 1 especially he's playing the game because this is Ephesians 1 state line Paul uses it twice okay sitting Ephesians 1 Luke 21 published the same year and Mark 13 because this is Mark state line also okay both Mark and Luke used the 56 date line. All right, and and what um, it also tag, tags Matthew 24 because the Matthew 24 date lines were 49 and 63, so he's sticking it right in the middle. Okay, because there's a pig temple sitting, and it's a later year 
than what those datelines signified in the earlier books, but it's got the same value. See, 56 always means vote short. That's how Moses used it in Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. He ends those two verses count 56 syllables because maybe the 70-year voting period won't complete because maybe the temple won't get rebuilt. And since this is about the temple, now we got a whore sitting on it in the form of a pig temple later in today, the Dome of the Rock. You see how apt this is? On the waters of politics. On the waters of false doctrine. Many waters. Now I'm going to stop it here because I wanted to just establish that yes, Revelation 17 is talking back to Matthew 24, Ephesians 1, Luke 21, Mark 13. It's literally playing on their words, but it's starting from a different time point. He's starting from 88 AD, so you've got to add 88 to each one of these numbers to convert to RAD and see the play. Okay? Now I'm going to go to the Mark 13 videos after this because we still got to play with whether or not these elision assumptions are right, the, whether they're really Hebraisms or not, okay, and I don't know. So this meter that you see here after this point is probably going to change, but we'll see, okay. Oh, one quick statement. 91 is when Christ was supposed to, when the tribulation was supposed to start, but he's nearly 92. So the whole reason for Mark writing, I mean, John writing Revelation, which he establishes in chapter 1, is because it did, the tribulation didn't start on time that everybody was expecting. And 35 and 14 is 49, diaspora, which is why it didn't start on time. Because people didn't grow, and that's why the first temple went down, and now the temple of church is effectively down. Which is why he's writing and saying what he did about the whore. It is not strictly speaking about the future. It's talking about now. All good writing might tell a story that seems to be about something else. And actually is about something else. But it's also supposed to have an application to you now when you're sitting in the audience watching the play. Just like Hamlet. You know, the play in Hamlet about the, uh, you know, Hamlet orders a bunch of actors to tell a play about a guy, who a king who dies because his brother kills him. And he's doing that in order to catch the conscience of a king. Well, that's the way all literature's done. It's supposed to apply to the watchers in one way, but the story is ostensibly about something else. Here the story is about something else too that's really going to happen. And it has application to you today, not just in the future. And that's the whole point. Because sitting right now on many waters is the Dome of the Rock. And if that's not an abomination and a horror, I don't know what is. Peace out.